One of the things that uh, I want to talk about today is there is something, there's a great mystery. You know, if you go to the CIA headquarters and you walk in, there is a piece of artwork that was erected there. It's called Kryptos. And Kryptos, if you look at it, is you'll see a big tree that's sticking out of the ground. You'll see a curved metal thing. And there's about 1,800 different characters that are written on this metal thing. And they look all random. So if you were to look at this, you would say, I have no idea what this is saying. And Kryptos is meant to be a puzzle. There's actually four puzzles inside of this one art diagram that this sculpture person made. And there are zero clues how to figure it out. And so Kryptos has been sitting there for about 20 years now. And it hasn't been solved yet. And what we have found over the years is that uh, there's a few people that have cracked parts of it. And the reason they haven't cracked it is it's based on cryptography, which if you um, understand, there's some really complex mathematical things. I don't know if you remember uh, uh, sitting in church when I was young. Sometimes we would pass a note, and it would be encoded, right? It would be a number, and another number, and number, another number. And then you had to have this key, right? So A equals 1, and B equals 2, and C equals 3. And then you could decipher it if you had the code. Well, cryptos is a similar thing. If you have the right sequence, you have the right formulas, you can cryptographically decode what this is saying. There's some people that have, so they take a look at it and then they try to figure it out. And there's been about four people that have figured out three quarters of the thing. There's one last piece of 97 letters that nobody has cracked yet, and it stood there for 20 years without being deciphered. So there's this mysterious object sitting in plain sight that nobody has any idea what it's saying at all. And what we find is that when we look in the Bible, there is actually something, a puzzle. There is a mystery that God stuck in the Bible in plain sight that a lot of people are looking at, and they have no clue what it says or does or what it's all about. And that mystery is one of the church. When we talk about Pentecost and when Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came, we found that the church was founded back at that time. And there's a great mystery of the church or about the church. Now turn over to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. Let's understand first, just very briefly, when I say church, what do I mean by that? When I say church, it's defined in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12 through 14. says, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body. So also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into the one spirit. For in fact the body is not one member, but many. And we find there it's by the spirit of God. When you receive the spirit of God in, in Acts, when the spirit of God came upon the people, this is what defines being in the body. When I say church, I mean the spiritual body of Christ. It's not necessarily an organization, not defined or by the boundaries of that, but it's those who have God's spirit and who receive God's spirit. Now, do those people tend to be together? Yes. It is not necessarily, it's not defined by a, 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 a boundaries of a physical org, but those with God's spirit are part of his body, and they do tend to congregate with each other. Now, back in those days, you had all types of people coming together, Jews and Greeks and slaves or free people. Can you imagine, back in those days, they had slaves. So somebody was a servant indentured to you, a slave. And then all of a sudden, you got called and your slave got called, and you show up to church. And this is what they encountered. And this is why it says it's one spirit. It's one body. It's one baptism. There wasn't one that was a better baptism that the owner got and the slave got a lesser one. It's the same one, and it was a great equalizer back in those days. But when you came to church, you were sitting around possibly a slave that at home is your slave, but at church is your peer. Women were treated badly back then, you know, and it's a, you know, one single baptism, one single spirit, and everybody was made to be the same in the body. It's kind of like that with us, too. I don't know if you take a look around in the room, but uh, you know, how many of the people would you naturally become friends with? Would you ever run into the people that you sit with in the room here? God has brought together such a mix of people together from all over the place, all different backgrounds, just like in those days. But we all have one common thing. We have the Spirit of God in the baptism. 
And we are together in this room. Not that, you know, so you, you would, uh, it's just that you probably naturally wouldn't run into each other in so many circumstances. You're not running in the same circles or things or same locations, but God has brought us together. And it's an amazing thing when you think about bringing so many different diverse people from different backgrounds together with one spirit, one unity, one body. And the work that he's doing with that is amazing. So there was a chasm in society, and there always is. There's rich, there's poor, the haves, haves not. There's all types of things. But when you're coming to the body, it's one spirit, one baptism. And this was like that today, and it's like it now. So God has put in his Bible some incredible mysteries. As we heard this morning, the idea that we can become gods or our gods or children of God and will become eventually just like Christ is a thing you don't hear. Do you know what? There are things that I will talk to you about today that you won't hear in other places. You won't hear these things because the world does not recognize, cannot see the mysteries that the Bible has that God shows us and gives to us. So today, let me cover, and I'll do these fairly rapidly, let me cover with you five mysteries about the church, five things that God says about the church. And, the, and it answers a lot of the questions that we have. Why do we have a church? What's, what's the reason for it? Is it just to show up here and put a suit on and listen to a sermon and fall asleep in the afternoon? No, it's not. In fact, if you fall asleep, I'm going to call you out. You'll have to stand up. We will all call you late to see in, and then you'll have to do jumping jacks, okay? <laughs> I'm just kidding. You don't have to do jumping jacks. All right, so... <laughs> So let's go through these mysteries. What are the things that God says? First, let's turn back to Ephesians 3, verse 9. Ephesians 3 and verse 9. And this is where we find that it's written down. Ephesians 3, verse 9. It says, And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now this is, says there is a mystery. There is a mystery from the beginning of ages that has been there, that's been hidden. Just like cryptos is sitting out in public sight, people can open this Bible up, and so many people have read this Bible and looked at it. And they still have not seen the mysteries. It's in plain sight, right in front of them. It's been hidden. What's the first mystery? It's actually in this scripture right here. The first mystery has to do with why are you and I as a church left in this world? Why are we here? Why are you and I here? You know why? Because we as a church are to witness to the heavenly realm. Do you know that you're on display right now? It says right here, the intent. So the intent is in, uh, that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. God has wisdom he's doing. It's a mystery. It's made known by the church to who? To the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Whenever you see that term principalities and powers in heavenly places, that's referring to the spiritual rulers of the world. Do you know that that is saying that the first mystery is God put a church here on earth so that we can, with what we do and go and say and are and act and be, are a witness to the spiritual principalities and powers that are out there. You are being watched. God is saying, I am doing a plan and I have a great wisdom here and I'm putting it on display. And guess who's it's for? It's for the principalities and powers. It's, the, it's for the angels that are with God, but it's for the evil principalities and powers that are out there as well. God is revealing and showing to them something. He's showing to them this plan. He's showing to them this wisdom. He's showing to them this thing that's in plain sight as he unfolds through his church. Man, if you stop and think about that, that's quite amazing. So you and I show up, we put on a suit, we talk, we sing our songs, we do things, but do you realize that you as a body are on display to the spiritual world, and what we do with each other is showing God's wisdom or not. How our lives go shows God's wisdom or not. How we treat each other demonstrates the wisdom of God and his plan or does not. This is who we are in display with. 
He's making this wisdom that he's done known. You know, and if you think about this too, who did he call? God called the foolish and the weak of the world, right? That doesn't make any sense to the spiritual world. You know, they'd say like, oh, look at these people. Wow. Those aren't the cream of the crop, are they? You know, I remember we used to say like, hey, uh, you know, God, I wonder why God called me. I must have some special ability. You know what special characteristics you have? <laughs> You're the weak in base things. It's always great to uh, insult your audience from up here. <laughs> but really, we are the weak in base. <laughs> We're not the great things of this world. You know why? Because it's not about you and your abilities. It's not about us. It's about showing the wisdom of God. It's not about me and how what I can do or not. It's about manifesting God's wisdom. He's taking the weak and base things of the world. He's bringing them through a cycle and showing the principalities and powers are mocking you. Ah, oh, yeah, you, you guys are like the armpit of the world. You guys are nothing. And God's saying, yes, and guess what? By Christ's death, sacrifice, and the process I bring them through, look where I'm going to bring them and turn them into gods. You know what the principalities and powers are doing? They're laughing at that. It's not possible. You can't fix these people. You can't help these people. Look at this. Look how many problems. Look at how they work. It makes no sense to the spiritual world. It looks like foolishness, right? It looks like foolishness. But God is doing something that's great wisdom, and he's taking you and I. So you and I have the special qualities of being base and weak. So just remember that. Let's keep ourselves a little humble here. The glory is not for us. It goes to God. It goes to God. And this church is not going to be massive. This is not a massive worldwide organization. We're not going to be a huge amount of people. It's going to be a small flock. It's like a grain of mustard seed. It starts small, but it grows into the biggest. Right? If you think about that, all of those things run counter to how Satan, the world, thinks. The world is about power. It's about being in charge. It's about being persuasive, charismatic, and you know, presenting yourself some great way. It's about having money and power and a bigger, bigger base. That does not smell like any of us. I can tell you right now, that is not our church. And that's because it's not our glory and it's not our characteristics. It goes to the wisdom and glory goes to God. This is what he's manifesting with us. And it's on display to the principalities and powers that are mocking that and laughing at it. So humility doesn't make sense. You know, if Satan knew what he was doing to kill Christ, he wouldn't have done it, but he didn't get it. It made no sense. And afterwards, he was defeated. He defeated himself by doing that, didn't realize it. You can see how the wisdom of God happens. It's in plain sight, but people don't get it. But then it's manifested over time. And this is what God is doing with his church. So the first mystery, the first mystery that we unlock is that we, as a body, what God is doing is left in the world to witness to the principalities and the powers. That's amazing. You're on display to the entire unseen realm. You're on display to the entire unseen realm. Mystery number two. Mystery number two. Let's turn back to Job chapter one. Job chapter one. Job chapter one and verse, I mean, sorry, we'll start with Job one verse six, but then uh, we'll also go to chapter two. There's a few key scriptures in here. We find that this unseen realm, this is another part of the mystery. There's this unseen realm is doing something before God. Job chapter 1, verse 6. It says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, Yes, Satan typically does. He's a wishy-washy guy. I'm just walking around the earth, walking back and forth. And God says, Well, hey, have you uh, considered my servant Job? He already knew. God already knew. Right? He said, if you considered my servant Job, that there's none like him on the earth, a blameless and an upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. So Satan answered the, answered the Lord, and he says, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around, him, around his household and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands. His possessions have increased in the land, but now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. And this is where he lost his family and all of his belongings. And he fell down, shaved his head, and he said, Naked I came in and, and naked I go out. I can't take any of these things with me. 
Now, the mystery here is that Satan, the spiritual realm that you're on display with, stands before God and accuses you and I of many things and that his plan is not going to work. He says, it's not going to work, God, because look, you know what? These people down here that you've called, the only reason that they're obeying you is because you said when you do something well, they will bless them. You've blessed their hands. You've set this hedge about them. You've given them favor. You've given them, look at all that livestock. Look at all those things. And so Satan can't get the fact that it's not just because of that reason that you may have blessings that you're here. And Satan argues to God and says, you know what? If you were to take the blessings away, all these people in this room would stop following you, would stop obeying you. And he's arguing that his plan is not going to work, that his plan is actually foolish. And so he's, and God says, okay, if that's the case, go ahead and take all the things away. And Job had the right response. Job had the right response. Turn over to chapter 2. Turn over to chapter 2. Because according to Satan, his wisdom says, You're all, we're only looking out after ourselves. I'm here because I do well, and God blesses me, and I get blessings. But if that were to stop, we would all desert this place. He goes on with the argument even further. He goes on even further, chapter 2. It says, And there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? And Satan said, yeah, to the Lord, from going to and fro on the earth and walking back and forth in it. Again, he cannot even answer a question straight. And the Lord said, have you considered my servant Job, that there's none like him on the earth, a blameless and an upright man, and one who fears God and shuns evil? And still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without a cause. So Satan comes up with another argument that he levels against you and I. He says, skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. You know, take all the stuff. Yep, he'll still hold on, cling to number one. I'll keep myself alive. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said, Behold, he's in your hand, but spare his life. And Satan went out and struck him with painful boils from the sole to the, you know, the crown of his head. And so now he's in a miserable, miserable spot. This is another argument that Satan says about you and I. You know what? When things are going well and you're not suffering, then your people will follow you. But if you have to, they have to suffer in life, then they're not going to keep following you. And this is the mentality of the world, isn't it? And God says, are you willing to suffer with me? Because if you suffer with me, you'll be glorified with me. And Satan's leveling to God that his plan is not going to work, that these people are not willing to suffer. They're not willing to go through something difficult. They're not willing to go through a hard time in life. As soon as they hit it, they're going to leave and bolt. And what we find is these arguments are the same ones that Satan is using against you and I to say the same thing. That you're just in it for yourself. You're just here for being the blessings. Take all these things away and give somebody a hard life. Then they're gone. Then they're gone. This is where we start to see this dialogue, this picture, is the same thing of what the church is on display with. This conversation is happening up in the realm of heaven. And it's about you and I sitting here. And Satan's saying the same things about you. And he's saying other things about you. And then all of a sudden, what we find is this happened up here in the heavens, this conversation, and then down here on earth, wow, what happened here all of a sudden? I have a fiery trial. This thing happened. I have no idea why. The same dialogues are happening with you and I. We're not privy to them, but we know by this example that they do happen. And we know that God is saying, look, these are my servants. Test them. Try it and see what comes out the other end. And this is a great mystery to the world because the world, a lot of times, will preach a health and wealth gospel only. This is what they say, that, hey, you do this. God wants, uh, you know, I went to a couple other churches. We were in Australia looking for a school for our kids, and they're uh, private, uh, private schools, and they're all mostly religious-based. And so we went and sat in to see what chapel would be like in school. And I sat in uh, one of these services, and... Um, you know, it's entertaining, 
It was good. I'm not saying anything about, you know, all that kind of stuff. I'm just saying that the message was only about that God wants you to have double. You, if you don't have double, then just pray more to have double. And it was very much, you know, make you feel good. And if you're not being told that you need to repent and you might have hard sufferings in life, you're not getting the true gospel. You're not getting all of it. God does want to bless you. Those, there are true things there. But you have to say, and it has to be true, that when Satan says, these people won't obey you if they suffer, that you say, I am willing to suffer with Christ. I am willing to go through these hard things that I have to in life. I am, and I will still follow God. I'm not just here because of the blessings. Remember, what did uh, Christ say to Peter? Christ said to Peter that Satan has asked for you, that he may sift you as wheat. It's the same concept. Satan thinks he knows what would get to Peter and what would cause him to not obey God, and he's asked for you. And Christ prayed for him. He wanted to test him. He wanted to say. He leveled an accusation against Peter. We don't know what it was, but he said he's asked for you. He wants to sift you like he did with Job. And you know what? Peter originally failed before the Spirit. After the Spirit, he was a changed man, as we heard. He was a different person. He was a completely different person. And he took no glory, no credit to himself. He wasn't chopping people's ears off with a sword and things like that anymore. He was a changed person pointing to God. But what we find is the mystery number two is is that Satan accuses you and I of many things and talks to God about his plan will not work. So we see the church is a demonstration of his wisdom, and Satan is constantly accusing and saying, nope, if you do this, it won't happen. Nope, if they make them suffer up, they won't stay around. And we find that that is taking place on a spiritual level um, in the third heavens. And this is where we see things happen in our lives, not just by accident. There's purpose. There's purpose to these things. We don't always know what it is at all. We can't answer, and we aren't privy to that conversation up there, but there's purpose to it. We know that there is because we read this. And so what God is answering by putting the church on display to the principalities and powers is he's answering the great question, will man obey God and be faithful to him regardless of all of these things? The question has to be answered. Satan bailed out. But we're going to answer this question once man understands this, right? This is a purpose of why you're here on the earth. Satan insists that he accuses us and that God's purpose can't be fulfilled. The church can never be a beautiful bride as God intended for his son. And he claims that the church and individuals are not going to be faithful to God. And so he tries to prove this. He tries to prove it's futile, God, what you're doing. And this is the great question that has to be settled. We're going to settle it by living through the era and the time that we have. And this is why the church was formed, to be a witness, to show that no matter what and how extreme and how hard and what the suffering is, that they are a set of people that will believe and trust and will follow God. No matter what, the trials, the sufferings, or losing things. No matter what. And so... This is the great question that has to be answered because Satan deviated off. He was under a perfect ruler, perfect government, perfect setup, and he went off. We're going to be under the most extreme circumstances and hardest of times and biggest trials and sufferings, and we will still obey. And this is what God is proving out. So that's why it says the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Amazing if you think about that, the purpose that you and I have. This is why we should pick our eyes up beyond just, hey, we're going through the motions and think on that level. You're being watched. And how we interact with each other, how we respond to these things shows and proves the wisdom of God and to his glory to everyone out there, to the principalities and powers. Mystery number three. Mystery number three. This evil realm's main purpose is to overcome the church. I don't know if you ever hear these type of things said out there, right? I haven't heard this type of of talk, but the evil realm's main purpose is to overcome the church. How do I find that? Matthew 16, 18. Matthew 16, verse 18. Matthew 16, 18, it says, And I also say to you, uh, say 
to you that you are Peter, little rock, and on this big rock, Christ, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And we understand that 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 means that it will exist over time, for sure, but it also means something else. There's something deeper when it says the power of the grave. The power of the grave won't prevail against the church. You know, what we find is we also read, pair that with Ephesians 6.12, for our struggles not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Those same forces are at war, and they are out to overcome the church. Christ says that that they will not overcome the church. How do I know that? Because the gates of hell, hell or death, we have to understand what that means. So the statement <clears throat> talks about the great captivity of all mankind, what you're subject to. You can't break out of death. So think about this. You and I, before you're called, in the re- any of the world, it's not yet called. You're under the penalty of death. If you do not repent of your sins, and if you do not ask for forgiveness and come to God, then it, death, the... the, the um, Penalty for sin is death, ultimately. So we can't break out of that unless we're released or we're redeemed through the death of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 2.14, let's turn there. Hebrews 2.14. Hebrews 2 and 14. Hebrews 2 and verse 14 says, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. And he released those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And then verse 16, For he indeed does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. He gives aid to those who are the true seed right? The gates of hell, the power of the grave, that is of sin. Because it's saying that if you go back to sin, and if you don't repent, what comes from that is death. That is the power. It says there in verse 14, he destroyed him who had the power of death. Christ's sacrifice and claiming that, if you don't, if you don't constantly claim that and ask for forgiveness, then Death is the only other option. It's the only way to pay through it is through Christ, our Savior. So Satan has the power of death. And so this is saying the power of death is not going to overcome the church. The spiritual power of death is not going to overcome the church. That means that Satan is constantly trying to get you to go back to that. Get you to give this up. Get you to sin and stay there and reject God so that the only thing is death. That's what the ultimate thing is, is death. And then Christ is saying here that I will build this and death shall not prevail against it. Death shall not prevail against it. Why not? Revelation 12.10. Revelation 12.10. Revelation 12.10. Satan wants to overcome the church. He wants to introduce and have sin be a part of it have it be a part of our lives so that we go off we're no longer want to be anywhere near God in his way revelation 12 10 says they weren't overcome but they overcame him by the word of their testimony we have the truth you have the truth that is what they had the blood of the lamb sacrifice of Christ for those sins and they were willing to go to death if it required it. Can you see that? This is how they overcame. It has to do with forgiveness. The gates of death, hell, are not going to overcome the church. If the church is constantly repents, believes in the blood of Christ, and are willing to die if that was required. Can you see that? This is how the church overcame Satan, overcame him. Having and staying with the truth, relying on the sacrifice of Christ, and being willing to die if it took it, take us that. There's nothing you can do to overcome a people if you're willing to give your life, if you're willing to constantly ask for forgiveness and if it requires that. And I hope it's not required of you. It might be required of some. 
but you, the willing, they're willing to go to the death with that. So what we see here is the third mystery is the evil realm's main purpose is to try to overcome the church, to try to get the people to not go down that path, not stay with the blood of Christ, not continue to ask for forgiveness, introduce sin, which leads to death, and take people off with that. Christ says they're not going to overcome. It's not going to overcome my people because they love the truth. They love and they rely on the sacrifice and blood of Christ for sins. And if it's required, they will go to the death. You can't overcome a people that are willing to do that. Think about that. So when we say the gates of hell will not prevail, yes, it's over time. That means it always exists, but it also means spiritual death is not going to prevail over the church if they stick to those things. That's the wisdom of God manifest. It has nothing to do with just our efforts. That's the wisdom of God of what he has put in place. So the evil realm's main purpose is to overcome the church, and Christ said that it won't. Now, mystery four. Let's go to mystery four. Mystery four. There are two kingdoms. There are two kingdoms. God's kingdom and the devil has a kingdom. Where do we find this? Luke 4, verse 5. Luke 4, verse 5. Luke 4 and verse 5 to 8. It says, Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you and the glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I can give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship me, all this will be yours. And Satan said, Get thee behind me, for it's written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and only him you shall serve. And what this says is that there, he has been given authority or delivered to him for a period of time. He says that. This has been delivered to me. He's showing him the kingdoms of the world, and I can give it to whomever I want. So what we find is that he has authority and a rule at this present time. That's something you never hear today. If you ask people, do, do you even believe that you know, Satan exists? They'll be like, oh, yeah, it's a fable, it's this or anything else. This is a real thing. There's a, a, a kingdom that's here. There's an authority. And turn over to Matthew 12, verse 25. Matthew 12, verse 25. And Christ reiterates this a certain way. A lot of times we read the scripture backwards, but it's important to read it the right way. Matthew 12, verse 25. This is when they were casting out some demons. And they were being talked about. Oh, these guys must be evil. And Jesus knew their thoughts. Verse 25, Matthew 12, 25. And he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. And every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? Christ declares that Satan is there and has a kingdom. And no, they weren't casting out demons by the name of Beelzebub. They said, Satan, if he divides against himself, it'll cause his kingdom to crumble. So he has one. Christ said it. There is one there. And then Christ goes on to say, if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, will whom do your sons cast them out? Right? Therefore, they shall be your judge. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now we have another kingdom that's entered the scene. Another kingdom is here. Satan has one. Another one's here. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then he will plunder his house. He who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters abroad. So we read this one and it sounds a little, you know, how do you interpret 29? Who's the strong man? Who's the strong man and who's, who's getting plundered? In this case, it's referring to the strong man as being Satan, his kingdom. And it says, how can one enter a strong man's house? How can Christ come in unless he first binds the strong man, makes him obsolete? Christ, and what he did, went through, made him the king and the ruler, and made the power of Satan obsolete. He bound him. He bound him first, and then he started to plunder all of those people that he's called out. He's plundering his house. He says, I am going to call this person. You're in your kingdom. I'm going to call you. I'm going to call you. I'm going to plunder this. And there's nothing that Satan can do about it. He's powerless. He's been bound by, this, by them. He, he, so the strong man is bound, and now he's 
Christ is starting to plunder and starting to call and pull people out of this. And so we have this two kingdom concept and it's reiterated by Christ. We have Satan being bound. We have Christ coming in and starting to pull people out. Colossians 1 verse 13. Colossians 1 verse 13 says this very thing. That Christ has come and started to pull people out. Colossians 1 verse 13 says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Think about this. He's conveyed. Conveyed's a word that I don't know about you, but I don't use that in English language every day. Conveyed just means moved or picked up from one place and stuck over in another place. And so what he says, he's delivered us from, so there's Satan's kingdom, that we were all blinded to that, and in that he has picked us up, and he has brought us straight over and dropped us into the kingdom of the son of his love. That's actually what he did. He plundered. You don't want to take this person, and boom, you are now under the authority of this kingdom. You are under my authority. You're in this kingdom, and I'm plundering, and I'm taking, and I'm taking, and we have that taking place. That's what the scripture is talking about. So it's a great mystery. The world, a lot of people don't realize that there's two kingdoms. The Satan has one, and he rules this world. And God has taken and picked you up and set you into another one. That comes with being in a church. That comes with benefits as well. So what we find is mystery four, that there's two kingdoms. The devil is given authority by God and rules a kingdom on this earth. You and I have been picked up and put into another kingdom. So he's taken us out. <clears throat> mystery number five. Mystery number five, then, is there is protection with the church. There is protection. This is not a small point. This is the point of it. This is the point of why you and I should think about why we would be together. Why would we want to be together? Why would we want to be in his body, in his church? It's because there is protection, spiritual protection. Before we were just in this other kingdom and at the whim of everything. Now we're over here. Turn to Luke 10, verse 19. Luke 10, verse 19. What we find is that God has set up a church and he set up an authority, he set up certain things that are there for a protection, a spiritual protection. Luke 10, verse 19 says, Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, but the, the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. So we start to see, and Christ says this in different ways, in different places, that he's given a, an authority to his body in his church, and he's talking specifically to his uh, disciples as ministers there to trample on the serpents and over the power of the enemy. And that's an authority that is nothing to do with you and I or stuff that we are. That is an authority God declared. And we start to talk about authority. I don't know about you, but whenever I hear, you've ever heard a sermon on authority, I go, oh, brother, the reason you're speaking that is because you want me to do something that you want. And then it's like, eh. It's really important to understand authority properly. Authority that God sets up is for us to see and understand what it is, first of all, and for you to want to submit to it, that you get the benefits of it. Think about the protection that's there of trampling on serpents and over the power of the enemy. If that's something that's needed, then submitting to the authority that has that, or let me take a simple example. God says if you need to be anointed, call on the elders. He doesn't say call on anybody. Is there some special thing that's in the oil that you have or in the, your fingers? No. You know what that is? God just declared an authority like that. It has nothing to do with, is that person a great speaker or do you like them? Right? So if you want to be anointed and you don't like the minister, you don't like their hairdo or they are boring speakers or whatever it is, it doesn't matter. You understand that God set an authority that this is what he just said. He said, if you are sick, call upon the elders. That's what God says to do. So when you realize, first of all, there's that, you ask and submit to it, you're blessed by God. It has nothing to do with 
some person trying to get what they want. In fact, if a person in authority is just trying to do it because of what they want, it's not the authority of God. So authority is for you to recognize and you to want to submit to what God has set up. If it's what God has set up, then you'll be blessed by it. So asking your minister what color car to buy is not part of the authority that God has set up. Because everybody knows black on black with black rims is the proper color to buy anyway. So <laughs> let's just settle that one right here. But those type of things are not. But God has set up, for example, anointing and other things like that. So he set an authority, gave it to them. He gave it to them, right? <clears throat> and uh, this is a, uh, he gave it to his, his ministry in this case. And this is why, you know, working with the spirit world or problems in that area, God has given an authority there. So that's if there's problems to come do. That has nothing to do with the minister. That has to do with authority God just declared and said. Um, <clears throat> now, there's protection in the body. Turn over to Revelation 12, verse 13. Spiritual protection is something you and I need badly. Spiritual protection is something you and I are going to need badly going forward. Here's an example of that, Revelation 12, verse 13 to 17. Revelation 12, 13 to 17. It's talking about Satan. It says, Now, when the dragon saw that he had been cast to earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. So this is talking about the church. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Verse 15. Verse 15. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. Now that's interesting because this is, uh, this is talking about church through time, but this is also talking about a time to come. A lot of prophecies you read have dual fulfillment. They have happened or are happening and or will happen. There's dual fulfillments to them. This is the same thing here. We know that the church went into hiding for a period of a, you know, a bunch of years and then came back on the scene, but we'll also find that this at the end time is going to happen specifically. And the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood. This is, again, coming out of the mouth. Satan is spewing things out of the mouth to overwhelm the church. A flood. You know, this could be an avalanche of words. This could be an avalanche of ideas. This could be an avalanche of, oh, well, that sounds like a cool new thing. I never heard that about in religion or this or some other thing that we want to that he wants to just spew out and overwhelm the church. And you know what happens here? It says, but verse 16, the earth helped the woman, the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon has spewed out of its mouth. There's protection. There's protection with the church, is what it's saying. There's protection spiritually by being in the body. Not off just trying to do your own thing, but being with the body. Being in a body, called and part of a body. There's spiritual protection that happens here, and this is a very important one because Satan's going to spew out a flood, and there's going to be intervention, so it does not overwhelm the church. And then 17, the dragon was enraged with the woman. He went to make war, the rest of her offspring, etc. So we find there's protection. There is protection. Turn over to 1 Timothy 3.15, and we find another great purpose of the church. Another great purpose of the church and the body. Again, these things are all mysteries. This is not just a social club. This is not just a group of people that are just trying to do the same thing over and over. There's spiritual things happening here with you and I. 1 Timothy 3.15 says, But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. There is a protection of the truth that is found in God's church. It is the pillar and the ground of the truth. There is a job that the church has. There is a role that it has been given and it's been blessed with is to preserve truth. It's the pillar and the ground of the, uh, of the truth. This is very important for us to know and realize it's easy for us. It's easy for you and I. It's very like appealing to go off and think, you know, I've got, I'm smart, I'm this, I'm special. You know, I think it's kind of in pretty soon we can get off on different branches and trees of things out there. And that's 
Every person's susceptible. I'm susceptible to that. And staying grounded and being with the body who is given the truth is very important. That's a spiritually protected place to help you not to get off on some tangent out in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of a desert. It's the pillar in the ground of the truth. That's If we start to think of it in spiritual terms, you start to realize why you would want to be here, why you would want to be with the body, why you don't want to go do just do your own thing somewhere, but you want to be with the body that God has set up and how he has set it up. Again, I didn't say it's just an org. I'm saying that the spiritual body, those who have God's spirit, you want to be with those who have God's spirit. Truth is one of those things. The flood of words is going to try to overwhelm the church. That comes out of Satan's mouth. It's not going to be the truth. And the earth helps. There's protection. And the church preserves and keeps that. So that's a very important thing when you think about that. That and being around and make sure that we keep and have the truth is critical. Critical. Now, one more thing on the authority thing. You can call upon this. When you're taken out of a kingdom and you're placed into another kingdom, you're not subject to this. You can call on the authority of this kingdom, the king of that kingdom, and the authority of it. Turn over to Matthew 8, verse 5. So you and I in our lives, don't we need to see ourselves as being called into this body and being plucked out, plundered, taken, and put into a different kingdom. Matthew 8, verse 5 shows us you can call on that. Do you need the help? Do you need the protection? Call upon that. Matthew 8, verse 5 says, Now when Jesus has entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him. And he said, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come to heal him. And the centurion answered and he said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. Okay, he was like, wow, okay, just have to say the word. For I also am a man under authority having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and another come, and he comes, and my servant do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled. And he said to those who followed, Assuredly I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not in all of Israel, or even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from the east and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness. And then verse 13 says, Go your way, you believe, so let it be done. Now, He said, I have not seen such great faith. Why is that? Why is that? Was it because he says, oh, just stay here and say it? You don't even have to come. I can know you can do it from a distance. Is that why he said that? It's not why he said that. He said he had great faith because you know why? He could see the authority of the kingdom. How did he see the authority of the kingdom? He says says to you, Lord, I'm not worthy. You should come under my roof. Only speak, right? He says, verse 9, I am also me just like you, am a man, did he say over authority? What did he say? He said under authority. That sounds odd, doesn't it? I'm just like you, under authority. Having soldiers under me, too. What does that mean? This means that he saw Christ for who he was, that he, Christ, as a king, was under the authority of God, the Father, and had umpteen millions of angels at his disposal. And he said, all you have to do is say the word because I know who you are. That's what, why he said you have great faith. He could see this invisible kingdom and the authority that was there. And if you think about this concept, this is what I mean by authority. We get authority wrong. We've had it wrong in the past. We've had it wrong in the past. It's not about drawing people to you at all. You point people to God. And he saw that. Christ said, I can do nothing in myself. Why did he say that? Was this a false humility? Did he say like, oh yeah, you know, really I could do this miracle, but I really just going to say I can't do anything. No. He could not do anything out of the bounds of what the Father told him he could say or do. He got his authority given to him. Whatever was in that authority, he could carry out. He called His disciples didn't lose him. He did miracles because of what he was given and what he said. These were all from the Father. He submitted to the authority of the Father. And guess what happened on the earth? Miracles. You and I submit to the authority that we are under, and we receive the blessings of 
that it is not about me, any person ever, doing something or telling people to do things or getting a following. You submit to the authority. And this is why he said, man, this, I haven't seen faith like this. Somebody who can see the invisible kingdom and the authority that's there and gets totally that Christ is a man under authority and he's got at his disposal all these angels and all of that whole chain, he could just say the word and this could happen. And so that's why it was great faith. He saw that unseen thing. This is not different than you and I. We can call upon that authority. You know why? Because you got plucked up here and put over here. That's what you're subject to now. You can call upon that. You can ask for that. You can ask for that. What examples in the Bible can you think of people who understood the authority of God that he had put in place? Can you think of any? I can think of a couple. One, King David. Remember when King David uh, was anointed and he was given the opportunity to kill Saul, right? What were all of the people around him saying? Hey, Saul came into a cave. He's hiding there, and they're like, Lucky, Lucky, you could just stab him right there. He's just right there. God, God has delivered him into your hands. Do we not see that? What did David know without a doubt? What did he see? He knew that that was God's anointed. Whether he was doing the right thing or whether he was doing the wrong thing, it was not up to David to kill Saul. He clearly understood this. They did not kill him for that reason. Everybody around him was like, hey, just do it, just do it. He's like, I clearly understand who this is. He submitted to the authority of God. You know what he had, you know what happened when he did? He suffered longer. He had to run more. (laughs) He could have ended that, but you know, he would have taken things into his own hands. And this is what Satan wants us to do, is to, no, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do it over here. What are some examples of people taking authority to themselves that they shouldn't have in the Bible? Can you think of any? When did it happen where people did the wrong thing, took authority in their own hands? Moses is one, right? So God said to Moses, hey, I'm going to give water to you guys. You walk to this rock and you speak to it. And Moses went up and he Bam, hit the rock, and he said, do I have to make water for you? (laughs) Right? No water came out. And then he hit it again, and God's like, oh, boy. I will save you from more embarrassment. I'll make some water come out, and then you and I are talking. Right? And that's what he did. And you know how important this lesson was? He was kept out of the promised land because of that. So, When I say this about the church and you submitting to the authority God has put in place, how important is it? Again, please, it's not about the person. When you know what God has set up in the authority and you put yourself under it, you are blessed by it. You, you know, if you call upon the elders, anointing, healing, if you realize who your king and master is, if you uh, do the things that he says, then you are blessed by it. You submit to authorities about you realizing it's there and you getting the benefit of it. Another one who didn't is Korah, right? Korah was probably, back in the day, an eloquent, charismatic person. Probably had a ton of great ideas for organizing. And, you know, Moses and you guys, you're just running a rickety ship over here. You know, I actually could do this much better. And look at all these people. They say, yeah, you know what, man? You could do this so much better. Boy, you could be our leader. That Moses is a little bit old school. He just doesn't know what he's doing. You could think of how this went. And they said, you know what? I could do a better job than you. I think I could. And he's probably a talented dude. Probably had a great following. Probably even worked out. You never know. Probably had all of those things where you go, wow, this, this guy has got it. You know the one thing he didn't have? He was not the one put in authority. God put Moses, even if he stuttered at first, even if he may not have been the most amazing guy you would see, God put him there. So when you and I try to go around and not do what God has set up, what happens? Korah was an example of that. He could have had it all. He could have probably done a better job. But God says, I'm sorry, this is not how I set it up. 
this is not how it's going to be. You're not doing this. And he paid the price for it and his families. Or other families, too. So this has to do with us recognizing what God has put in. And this is why I'm saying that there is an authority God gave in the church. And this is why we want spiritual protection. This is why we should want to be here. We should want to be part of the body. There is protection of truth. There is protection spiritually. There will be protection going forward. You're under, under a different authority, and you're protected by that. There is protection with the church for you and I. Don't underestimate that. Don't underestimate that. You know, Satan is the epitome of trying to go around authority. If you think about the Trinity that was talked about this morning, who knows, maybe that's Satan wanting to be the third Godhead. So he spins this Trinity story. What did he do? He will try to go up and say, I should be right up there with you guys. <laughs> right? And this is what he did. He got cast down. I'm sorry, it does not work like this. This is not how it's set up. And his thinking is this. And so he wants us. He wants us to take it authority to ourselves. He wants us to go off. He wants us to get off. With truth, he wants us to take things into our own hands. He doesn't want us to be together. He doesn't want a body that's together. So this, I ask you a question to kind of wrap these things up. How important is it to keep the unity of the Spirit? If you know these things, if you stack these things together, that you and I are on display to the entire spiritual realm, who has a sole goal to overcome you, that there are two kingdoms and that you're moved into a different kingdom and that there is protection when you're in this church. How important is it to keep the unity of the spirit? Turn to Ephesians 4 verse 1. Ephesians 4 verse 1. Just a couple more scriptures and we'll wrap up a little early. Give people a chance to wake back up. Talk. Ephesians 4 verse 1. It says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through you and in you all. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Endeavoring. <laughs> that is work, <laughs> isn't it? Endeavoring. I have to endeavor. I have to work at keeping the spirit of peace and unity, don't I? I don't know. If I were to give us a report card over time, I'm pretty sure we're not doing so well on this. But we may not have understood either what this spiritual body is all about in the purpose in the mystery that God is working out here how important do you think it is if you're pulled out and you've got a being trying to overcome you and get you to sin get you to divide off get you to devour each other get you to go back into all those things how important do you think the concept of unity is then it is all important. It is super important. And when we read in Acts, the church was found, what did they do? You see a spirit of unity. They even sold things. They helped those who had less, right? The church was founded on this, and you see that happening, the one calling, the one baptism. So the unity. This is not about a government structure either. Satan was under the perfect government, and he still went off. This is about endeavoring that, keeping that spirit, keeping that one spirit, one faith, one baptism, forgiveness, constantly doing that. This is what this is about. We're the ones that let the evil realm in the door. Like, let's not do that. If you understand what this body is about, close that door. Don't gossip. Don't talk about a person. Don't destroy Don't tear down. Don't divide off. Don't leave and be like, oh, can't, you know, church would be great except for all the people. (laughs) And if only I could be up there, you know, my words are so eloquent. Leave it. It doesn't work. 
what God does, what he calls, what he sets up, and his authority, understand it, submit to that. This is where the blessings come. In this wall, I'll just read one more. Turn to 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven to 29. What is the church called? It's also the Lord's body, right? It's the Lord's body. How important is unity? I'm reading this scripture we read uh, during Passover, but it's this point. 1 Corinthians 11, 27, 29 says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the blood and the, uh, the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. How important is it to be unified? They were coming to represent the symbols of the death of Christ and a body that is unified and together, but they were bickering, and some had, some didn't, some were getting drunk, they were divided off. They didn't discern that this, where you're sitting, is the Lord's body, and that unity is one of the most important things that is there. They were superior to others, they were everything else, and they paid the price for it, some died. This is how important this is. It's very important for us to not fall to the traps, not to take the authority to ourselves, do what we think, not to talk about each other, not to divide off, not to go off on the fringe, but be grounded in the truth. Be always forgiving and always asking for forgiveness, the blood of Christ, all the way to the death. When we do that, we as a body have protection. We can claim and call on the kingdom of God and that authority stay in it stay with it stay with the body and you reap the blessings and the benefits the spiritual blessings that come there let's not open the door for letting the spirit world in let's not do that let's not you and I become a tool for destruction you have to work at that and endeavor that I mean it doesn't come naturally I don't mean pointing my finger at you I'm saying a person myself I have to work I have to forgive. I have to pay the price for someone else. I have to put forth a hard effort. You have to do endeavor. If you realize what you're in and what the blessings of that are and why the purpose of the church is, spiritually, you will get these things and it will become one of the most important things. So let me ask you, are you showing the wisdom of God in your life, in your church, with the people around you? Are you demonstrating to the spirit world there's an incredible mystery that's hidden in plain sight. It's written down that everybody's read and nobody gets. That the body, you and I are left in this world, that we're a witness to the principalities and the powers in the spiritual realm. You and I are on show, showing them the wisdom of God works. It looks like foolishness. We are the weak, but it works. Satan argues that it won't to God. And he's going to say this about you. Oh, just do this to them. They'll leave. Don't worry. Don't do that. Don't fall for that. And three, the gates of hell are bent on overcoming the church, but it will not prevail. In mystery four, there are two kingdoms that are set up. We've been picked up out of one, and we have been put into another. And we are under the authority of this one now. And there is protection spiritually for you and I in the church, in the body of Christ. There is protection under the authority. Think about knowing the authority, and we submit to what God has set up, we are blessed. We don't circumvent that, and that's what happens. So, you and I are being watched. Are we endeavoring to keep the unity of the body? We can see acts, they did it. Will you and I do it? The entire world is watching.